by my attitude that I most definitely from. Hello, everybody. Hello. We're back from Austin, Texas, uh, where we did South by Southwest. We had a wonderful time. Tyler Crowley, are you still in? Are you still there, Tyler? Or where are you? I, I am phoning it in from Texas. Phoning it in. Interesting uh, choice of words there, Tyler. Yes. Typing uh, it. In. The the lack of insights has led many in the audience to believe that you've been phoning it in lately. Yeah. Uh, no pressure. Okay. And so, are you in Austin still? Yes. And are you in a movie theater right now? No, I'm at my friend's house. He has a 12-person theater in his house. Who's your friend, Bill Gates? No. It, su surprisingly, the house is... You could buy this house in Santa Monica for... He paid... I don't want to tell you what he paid for the house. It, it's making me angry. Okay. So houses are cheaper in Austin. Leave it at that. Uh, yeah. This house would be $5 million in Santa Monica. He really? got it. Yeah, he got it for. I'm angry. I like I'm it. it. Looks like you're. Uh, it looks like you're Siskel and Ebert or Roger and Ebert at the movies or something. Yeah, you're gonna give us a review with the with the movie behind you there of Avatar or something. Yeah. Uh, so South by Southwest, huge success. Hundreds of people came to the this week in startups uh, event. Tony Shea, wonderful guest. A uh, little bit of technical problems. It happens sometimes. No big deal. Apologies to the fans in the audience who maybe couldn't hear everything. Uh, we'll get it right next time. It was good, I understand, for the people who were home. Uh, what would you think of the show, Tyler? Yeah, Tony is such a soft-spoken person in person. Yeah. That I recall when we had meetings with him back in, you know, at the Zappos office in, outside of Vegas. In the middle of the meeting, I found myself saying, I can't hear what he's saying. Yeah, he's a, he's a whisperer. Yeah. He's a CEO whisperer, but the book is doing fabulous. People really loved him as a guest, and it was just great to see all the fans there and hang out with them. So thanks to uh, Bing and Sonos and Redpoint uh, and all the other sponsors who helped us make it amazing. South by Southwest, just tons of debauchery and partying going on down there. Did, did you actually get anything accomplished? I know this is your vacation week, so yeah. technically you don't have to get anything accomplished, but was, was there any business that you saw actually occurring at South by Southwest? I think there was. I mean, I've bumped into a couple of really cool people that might become sponsors of this show our other shows and the uh, Open Angel Forum shows, some Mahalo stuff. Uh, the most interesting thing in my mind about South by Southwest is there's the internet part, which we were all there for. Then there's the music part, which is going on now. And I think the most apropos line I could whip up for this is going to South by Southwest for the interactive and not staying for the music is very much akin to going out for drinks and not going back to her place. Because the music is such a much better part of, you know, uh, as an event. Wow, that's a incredible insight, Tyler. Insight from Tyler. There you go. You got one under your belt already, and it's only five minutes into the show. Uh, what an amazing show we um, have today. We've got a creator on the show. We get a lot of times CEOs on the show. A lot of times we get investors. We haven't had enough actual creators, people who actually roll up their sleeves and build things, so I'm really excited to have David... I'm um, hopefully I'm going to get this right. Uh, Heinemeyer That's Hansen. Right. Yep. David Heinemeyer Hansen. It's not that hard to say. Uh, now, David Heinemeyer Hansen is, of course, uh, the creator of Ruby on Rails, uh, a partner at 37 Signals, which is yep. an amazing company. Uh, where is it based? 37 Signals is uh, virtual? all over the place. Yeah, so, virtual company. But half the company is in Chicago. Half the company is in Chicago. Uh, and also, you're the creator of Basecamp, which yep. many startups actually use right. every day. Absolutely. Um, and so, man, we have a ton of things to talk about uh, when we do the interview segment. But at the beginning of the show, we always, people's favorite segment is to uh, do Ask Jason, ask an entrepreneurial question. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just get that question right out of the way. And uh, special thanks to Power VPS, uh, our sponsor uh, of the uh, Ask Jason segment today. Power VPS provides fully managed virtual private hosting uh, that's in the cloud. You know about cloud computing. You've done a little cloud computing in your day. Uh, and it starts as low as $59 a month. And Twist viewers get 25% off the life of their plan. That's forever. I think that's what for life means. If you use the code TWIST, and what did they do, Tyler? They gave somebody hosting for life at the uh, South by Southwest show. Is that right? One year. Oh, one year. So right. they gave somebody free hosting for a year, plus some other stuff. They gave them free DNA mail for a year. 
Correct. And free internet access for a year, everything. And, and an hour of consulting. And an hour of consulting. And they can come here for lunch. Who won? What was the pillow company won? Yes. That was pretty interesting. Uh, the guy who made pillows won. Uh, so uh, do we have the caller? Do we have the Ask Jason caller? Little infographic. Afghanistan. Two. Okay. Uh, I hear a caller on the line. Uh, Angela, you're Hi. calling from the 704. Yes, Charlotte. Charlotte. Is yes, that? North Carolina. That's NC, right? Yep. North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, they have a basketball team there, correct? Yeah, the Bobcats, who uh, Michael Jordan is now the majority owner of. Yeah, that just happened this week. Uh, and yep. he's got something to prove, huh? I mean, after <laughs> the last couple of years, he really he really wants to get that team to the playoffs and to the finals. Yeah, hopefully it'll work because uh, last season wasn't too good. Yeah, well, try being a Knicks fan. Um, <laughs> no sympathy for anybody when you're a Knicks fan. So you have a question for us. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us? Sure. Um, so I have a company, Black Web Media, and our, our flagship property is Black Web 2.0. And my main question is about your experience um, with Weblogs, Inc. I really want to know if you think that model will, will work in the web business like today as it is now, if it needs modifications to actually work, and also if you think it will work in a vertical um, or a specific niche like only sports, or in my case, only African American websites. Yeah, uh, this is a great question. I get this question a lot. You know, you, you come up with a business idea. That was 2000, 2003, 2004 when we came up with that idea and started executing on it. So basically, a series of websites connected together uh, that share uh, common ad sales, a common technology platform, and uh, maybe some best practices for editorial. Uh, common design. Uh, that's a good idea. The problem today is it's a much cra more crowded space. So literally when we launched Autoblog and Joystick and, in, and Blogging Baby and Gadling and some of these things, we were the first like non-individual blog, you know, like not an individual's you know, personal blog, to actually come out. So Gizmodo was the first gadget blog and Gadget was the second. Autoblog was the first automotive blog of note, I guess, Jalopnik was the second. So it wasn't as crowded. Uh, now it's much more crowded, so I think you have to pick an, a niche and do it really well. And so I think, sure, picking a demographic to go after and you know, uh, hitting it hard is great. You have to be really willing to um, invest money and go slow. Um, these are like uh, hot coal businesses. You have to like really build up the hot embers, when that basically means writing talent, brand, you know, readers, it takes a while. I think everybody wants it to happen overnight, and it's very difficult to do as the industry becomes more mature. Uh, what do you think? Did it really uh, matter about the network, though? Wasn't it more of like a hit business in the sense like you guys had a gadget, right? Yeah. Like, wasn't that way, way bigger than any of the other stuff? Um, yes and no. Uh, it was definitely the Halo brand, right. and we, de we definitely built things off of it. Auto, little known fact, Autoblog was actually making more money than Engadget. So on a revenue basis, Autoblog was the number one blog, and then on a traffic basis, clearly Engadget. Uh, but it wasn't Engadget was maybe 30 or 40 percent bigger than the next sort of joystick. Right. And well, I was just in that sense, like if you're going to start something new, why not just focus on one thing? Like why start the network right, right away? Start the network once you have something that's like already high quality. Added. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't need to invest in like having 10, 15, 20 blogs right. when you can just start to get going and see if there's any traction at all in that niche. If you right. can't sell any advertising on one blog, then right. probably not going to sell on 10. It's, it makes a good point. Uh, you know, it really depends on how many resources you have and how much experience you have. Is this your first like publishing endeavor, or have you been in the publishing business for 20 years? Um, no, this is my first publishing um, endeavor, but I've worked in the internet industry for a lot of other um, dot coms, mainly large ones that are owned by IAC. Um, oh, really? But okay. we start, yeah, we started our, our, our main site, Black Web 2.0, in 2007. Right. And we're just now starting to roll out other, other websites. Yeah, so it's, uh, you, you can, one of the problems people make was there was a, there was a company called B5 Media, which mm -hmm. aspired to be like a Weblogs Inc. or Gawker. And they said, we're going to do, okay, uh, Gawker and Weblogs have a blog about celebrities and a blog about cars. 
therefore we're going to do a blog about every car and a blog about each celebrity. So they did the Britney Spears blog or blogging, you know, right. whoever. And they went too niche. And none of those things were compelling enough for anybody to ever go to them, you know. Uh, what you really have to do is connect, learn how to connect with people and write stories that people are willing to retweet. This was always my benchmark for a great writer. If people were so compelled by a story that they felt the need to email it to somebody, instant message it to somebody, comment, that's a story of impact. So what I would tell you is forget about the big architecture of the network and how many blogs you're going to have and start with that. Can you write a story that gets retweeted 10 times? And then once you get one that can be retweeted 10 times, can you do it 20 times? Can you get a page on the fr- can you get a story on the front page of Dig? And that's not all stories have to be on the front page of Dig, not all stories have to be retweeted, but that is that was what made Engadget and Autoblog and those places special was that they came up with really good ideas, the writers that we we found to to make editorial you couldn't ignore. It had impact. It, you know, it made people do something. So really start thinking about it on a per post basis and on a per writer basis. A lot of people think it was because we had 20 blogs all linking to each other mm-hmm. and it made an SEO or we would introduce, you know, joystick to the reader. It's like it has to be clear and the logo needs to be good, you know, and simple. That's why Twitter has a nice logo and it's easy to spell and I think right. that that might be a little bit overrated, but I do think like, if you can't hear what the name is and then look it up on the web, that that's going to be a problem. Yeah. So I would totally change the name. Don't worry but about. This, like, I mean, I I hear you guys, but yeah. like I mean, you don't. You, you also have to consider like two two guys doing it on the side, and plus we have over three thousand signups. I mean, if those things were right. that bad, as you totally, that's awesome. That's, that's why you're. That's you know, why like, Tyler says you're a, you're. You're a hottie. You're the homeless hottie in the hip hop club, or whatever his metaphor is. The fact is, there's good stuff here. Right. We we, like, we believe you. Three thousand people signed up. The interface is pretty slick looking. I mean, it's yep, obvious somebody yeah. has some design skill, and the idea is pretty good. I mean, you know, I could see David sort of nodding once he got into the idea a little bit. I started nodding. Okay, there might right. be a problem here. You have virtual, you know, a bunch of different coders working on something. You want to have a web interface to get to the stuff, maybe. Well, maybe yeah. people want controls, maybe they don't. Maybe I've got such a big site, I want one person working on True. something, but not FTPing files there. But I if, agree if I respond, If I respond to David, like, for a second, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if we are talking about startups, all the startups I know in New York, I know more than 20, they get people from Odesk, and that's a real pain point They get here. people from where? The, from Odesk. Like, you know, oh, you yes. hire someone okay. from China, you hire someone from India, oh. you, you hire them for like 10 hours, 20 hours on a, on a small thing. So not everyone is like 37 signals savvy on their tech infrastructure. And when they started out on my, okay. on my last gig, the, 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 the CEO was spending like $4,000 on, on the servers only and all those things were running only like MySQL, SVNs and like simple stuff. So when we give that out for free, People appreciate that, and developers appreciate that we don't charge them anything for hosting. They just get a free account, free domain, free database, and they don't have to install anything to their desktop computers. And that's how we started. And I took uh, Jason's advice, like launch early, launch crappy. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the crappy part. Like we just launched okay. a month ago, okay. so uh, that's why it's like missing right in there. And I take all your feedback. Good. Because, you know, we're aware of them. And I'll tell you what I like about, we have to wrap this call up because we're going for 22 minutes, but, um, and I don't want to run out of show. What I do like about this call, I will say, is that I do not have to prescribe an abundance of Gladiator or Black Hawk Down <laughs> because you have fight in you. When people started poking at your baby and saying, your baby's ugly, your baby's got a bad name, you fought, which means that you care. So then what you've got to do, you know, uh, David, very arrogant guy, Myself, uh, tremendously arrogant. No. Wikipedia used to say Wikipedia so. Wikipedia so. says David is incredibly arrogant. Uh, Tyler, I can tell you, is insufferably arrogant. No, he's not. Tyler's a humble guy. That's why, that's why we work well together. He's a very humble, deft guy, and I'm a very arrogant guy. But that's good. You're confident, and uh, you've seen Black Hawk Down, and you've seen uh, Gladiator, correct? I guess. You guess? <laughs> You guess if you've seen this? Okay, you need to go watch these movies because you have that fight in you. And uh, I like that. So it's a great start. I'm going to have uh, super fan Scott Simcoe check in with you like maybe in 30 days and see how progress is going. And we're going to track your mm-hmm. story. And I think that okay. uh, you, you got great potential. I appreciate you calling in to the Shark Tank. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. I like when the guy gets a little defensive at the end. It's, although it's like, 
you know, we've all been there as entrepreneurs, right? When, right. You, when people start poking your baby and telling you, like, sure. this sucks. Like, oh, Basecamp doesn't have this feature. Absolutely. And Ruby on Rails doesn't scale. And they start poking you. you got to fight. You do. Yeah, same thing happens when you tell the homeless girl she's got to, you know, wear a nicer dress. <laughs> Right, Tyler. <laughs> From my experience, you're the kind of yeah. guy who would actually go up and tell them that. <laughs> like, you need to get your hair did. Right. Absolutely. Uh, David, uh, you've had a pretty epic career. You've done a lot of great things. How did this all start? I mean, wh how did you get into technology? Take me back to when you got your first computer. Sure. How did you get into the technology? Uh, how did you get into technology? And then how did you get into the technology industry? Which is really two separate questions. Right. So I got my first computer when I was six, and then. Not long thereafter, I had a bunch of friends who were programmers. And if there was one thing I took away from that was I was definitely not going to be a programmer. Because sort of being a programmer uh, in late 80s, early 90s, uh, at least for the programmer I was exposed to, was like C++ and Assembler and so on. I was like, eh, no interest at all. No interest in the Visual Basic? N no, no, <laughs> not that either. Um, and then I started actually getting into gaming journalism. So I did a, uh, a bunch of uh, gaming review sites. Ah. Um, and part of that was... What is this, 1995, 96? This is uh, 97. Yep, 97 okay. I get Early going days. with this uh, stuff. Tracking like uh, Quake 3 was one of the first sites right. we have. I had Quake3.dk for like tracking all the news about the right. upcoming Quake game. Um, and in the beginning I was just using another programmer. But then sort of as time went on, I just got annoyed that whenever I had to get something done, I had to ask somebody else. Right. Pay in the neck. Exactly. So just learn the shit yourself and then do right. it yourself was my philosophy for it. So I just I picked up some skills for doing PHP and was like, all right, this is not that hard. I can do right. this. Um, wired up. And then around 2001, I'd been doing this gaming stuff for some time. And uh, I actually worked at an incubator. Uh, oh, really? Which, um, in Denmark? In Denmark, yep. Wow. And, uh, so the incubators I, made it there too. They made it there too, but I could see which way they were going, and that way was down. Why? So, Why? Well, just the whole industry. Like these guys were paying me a fairly nice salary. We had no idea how we were ever going to make money. We were just burning venture capital, and like this didn't seem like it was going to pan out. Even in Denmark, out. they were getting venture capital. Was it from like, like a? Like it was actually from a bank, somewhere, which uh, was even worse because I think some of the guys were on the hook for the money and had to pay it off. This is what people don't realize. In the United States, you get a, a venture capital or whatever, even a loan, you, you're not personally on the right. hook. But in Europe and in yep. Asia, you have to sign a guarantee as an individual that you will Absolutely. pay that money. So if, you, if your business tanks, your startup tanks in Europe, what happens? Totally. Yeah, you're on the hook for the money. Thankfully, I wasn't signing anything right. anywhere, um, but uh, the boss is dead, and they were on the hook for, I think, a few million, and they Which have to pay that what? off. Which means what? They have to pay it off, or they have yeah. to sell their homes? I, no, I, I knew at least one guy who was otherwise a great guy, uh, but he got stuck with a huge bill that took him years and years to pay off, even after he got a great job somewhere else. Does this so. screw up entrepreneurship? In Europe, is this why Europe isn't as competitive as the United States, and Asia is not as competitive as the United States in terms of entrepreneurship? I think there's some of that. Like yeah. when the risk is, if this thing fails, you're going to be broke forever. Right. Um, then you're probably going to be a little bit more hesitant. But I think you should just flip that around and then see. All right, what could I do without the money? Right. Like that's my preferred approach anyway. Right. Like, don't waste your time raising money. Don't right. waste your time doing all these things. Do it on the side uh, for as long as you can, and then uh, once it has legs, you can you can focus on it full time. But right. don't like try to just put everything into one basket and like right. this is either this is going to work or my life is going to suck. Swinging for the fences, Seriously. maybe not your style. No, maybe absolutely not. You like well, to get the singles and doubles, build up the revenue, find the customer base, and yes. maybe not be beholden to a huge check or to a huge VC. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's it's a uh, misconception that startups need external financing. I agree. My first two startups, no external financing. Put uh, them off revenues. That's in, by far the preferred way to go in my mind. And I, why I, is it the preferred way to go? Because all these bad things happen once you start taking other people's money and spending other people's money. There's nothing easier in the world than spending somebody else's money. And right. you'll start making bad choices in my mind. Right. Especially if this is one of your, if you haven't already learned how to make your own money, right. you're not going to learn it when you just take somebody else's. Right. Um, you're going to burn it on too much staff, too mu many computers. You're going to have too much of a runway. You're yes. not going to have that fire in your ass that I need to make this work right now. Otherwise, like, I can't go on doing it. When right. you have like a two-year runway, then eh, let's goof around for six months. Let's figure out how all this is going to work. Right. Money is something we can worry about later. Bullshit. Right. Now, 
flipping the coin. This is a very convenient argument. I used this argument when I was starting my career because no VCs would take a meeting with me, frankly. I, could, I, I didn't have access to that capital. Right. So my first company, I built it off my credit cards, built it at $12 million in revenue. Yep. Second company, I started building Weblogs Inc., going very well. Mark Cuban invested a couple hundred thousand dollars. We were friends. We never actually spent that money. Turned out really well. So I had like, angel financing in mm -hmm. the middle. Third company, Mahalo, very big idea. It's going to take a lot of people. It's going to take many years. I raise a bucket load, a large amount of capital for a small percentage of my company. Still maintain a lot of ownership in it. Mm -hmm. Do you think, now that you're becoming established in your career, if you have a great idea that takes a lot of people and you can raise $10 million for 20% of your company, still maintain control, and you would actually think about it, or are you just no. dead set against it? Don't, that's okay. So for 37 minutes, so we've is had... So is it a religious thing? No, it's a very practical thing. Ah. Like, first, I don't want to be beholden to anybody else, especially if I actually should ever get to the point, and this is, I have no motivations of doing it. I'm in 37 signals for the next 20 years. Right. So you found what you want to do. I found what I want to do. But even if I, I didn't, right. if I had, like, let's say we sold a company, and I was, we got a right. great payday. Why wouldn't I pick an idea I believe enough in myself to put in my own money to do it? Again, not thinking that I'm going to spend $20 million building right. this, but if it takes just a little bit to get it off the ground, let's just fund it on my own. In fairness, 37 signals, how many team members? 16 people. 16 people. The products are not as robust as, say, Facebook or LinkedIn. You would agree? I, I, much more complicated. Robust, uh, complication. Yes. yes I would much bigger things. It takes yes. many more people and much more money to build something at the scale of Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, wouldn't you say? No. The, the I think it's a just the infrastructure, the infrastructure costs of Facebook? All the terabytes and sure. terabytes of stuff? I mean, that's that hard is hard cost. Right. But yeah. if you build a company that's not just about begging for advertising crumbs, which right. these companies to a large extent are, right. like you build a company that scales right. in the sense that if you need more hardware, you get more money in on revenues. Like uh -huh. we ran off one server with Basecamp for the first year. By the time we had to buy server number two, who gave a rat's ass? Like it didn't, it didn't matter. matter that it costed another five hundred bucks to get another server because by then revenues were so far ahead of Basecamp cost. has how many users a month? Um Probably I think the, tens of thousands, hundreds uh, you know, of thousands? Yes. Uh, Facebook, hundreds of millions. I mean, you're right. talking about but a totally different scale. You couldn't do, if Basecamp was hundreds of millions of users and it grew on the, on the path of Facebook or Twitter grew, you would, it would by default require some kind of investment. It would take tens exactly. of millions of dollars. But we would be paying for that investment off the revenues. So if we get another million customers tomorrow, right. we're going to have great problems. We're going to have the problems of we now get a huge amount of money into the company and we can spend some of that money on buying servers. The problem I have is when people go the other way around. Right. We're actually getting more users is a problem, not a, uh, a good thing. Right. Like when Facebook gets another, I don't know, maybe they're at a different point now. Right. But if you're not making any money right. and you're just getting more users, that's not good. Like you're just spending more money. You're not getting more, so any money So you don't money subscribe in. to the swing for the fences, raise a bunch of capital, get a tens of millions of users, and then figure out how to make money from it later. Absolutely not. Right. Uh, interesting. I thought like you for a while, and then I changed my mind. What changed your mind? Uh, there is an unlimited amount of capital in the world. We live in one of the richest times ever in the history of mankind. There are resources everywhere. The resources are there freely for people with big ambitious ideas to get those resources and build big, like YouTube did, like Google did, uh, like Facebook but did. Why do you want to build big? If Especially if we take something like YouTube, right? right. So they spend how many, how many millions getting to the point of acquisition? Then Google spends another $1.6 billion buying yep. them, what, five years ago? Yep. And only now they're sort of figuring out how to make money? Right. Like they were just but talking about getting to break even now. 80% market share in videos. Who the hell cares? I oh, could I mean, not I give a rat's ass about market share if it doesn't mean uh, outside profits. Right. I think this is exactly where Apple has it dead on right. Like, people were for a long time saying, oh, the Mac is only like 7% of the uh, market share. Right. Like, who cares? If they have an outsized portion of the profits, that really matters. It, the same thing with the iPhone. The right. iPhone has, what, 10% of smartphone market? Right. And Apple has like 35% of the profits? Right. That's the position to be in. Hmm. And that's what I think like, the baseline for all these businesses is. Right. The only thing that matters in the end is profits. Right. Market share doesn't matter. It matters if it leads to profits. Otherwise, right. it doesn't matter. 
number of people doesn't matter, the amount of technology doesn't matter. None of this shit matters unless it leads to profits. Right. And I think there's just much easier way to get to profits than yeah. going through the worrying about getting out of 85% market share or any of this other stuff. And this is what annoys me about pulling stuff like YouTube and Facebook and all these other things that's huge successes and like this is going so great. No, it's not. It might be someday, well, but Facebook if you look has at over a billion dollars in revenue now this year. Who does? Facebook. Yep, over a billion absolutely. dollars. So they're and profitable with over a billion dollars in revenue. And they're but, hey, the largest How long did it take there? to get there? Like, if yeah. you look at the amount of money it took to put in there, and all right, they're there now. A couple hundred billion. Yeah. Right, exactly. Now they're there. This was the one company that then made it. Yeah. Like, if you look at all the other companies that's following the same model, right. they're not making it. Right. So this is like playing the lottery where there's one guy who's going to win that Powerball. Right. And for him, it was totally worth those 10 yes. bucks to buy the ticket. Right. For everybody else following the same model, no, it's not worth it. Hmm. Interesting. You make some compelling arguments. I think maybe it depends on where you are in your career. I think for some guys or gals, you know, if you're starting off, I think you're right. People who are new to the, to the, to the space, new entrepreneurs, you do need to get that instinct for making money like in hustling and building based mm -hmm. on revenue. Because I'll be honest, I built my companies like that in the early days. We built Weblogs Inc. If we get a sponsor for Joystick, we launch Joystick. Right. And it made us hungry and it made us focused on building great things. But then with Mahalo, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna build something big and try to solve a big problem and get a bunch of people. Yeah, then we get to 10, 15 million uniques and all of a sudden we turn on revenue and boom, we break even. I uh, think this is the problem. I think most people can't get that. Even if they get the 15, 20 uniques, then something happens in the market. If you're relying on something else that's just going to be like that magic switch where you turn on yeah. revenues, then all of a sudden something happens, like ad market goes way down, or right. some other external factor, like uh, CPMs go way down because there's right. too much inventory, or all of these other things you can come up with. Right. You Outside can't factors. bank on that like magic day where it switches over. I don't think it works like that. It's a very, it's more risky. Yes. It's like you're building something and uh, hoping that the revenue comes, hoping that a business model emerges, hoping that there's a monetization model. Which I don't understand because there's so many models where the business is there. Right. Selling stuff to people who want to pay for it, yeah. where you take more in than it costs you to provide. And, and frankly, advertising, which, is, which, which works, and lead generation cost per click. These things have, are established and make tens of billions of dollars a year. You can't say that they're not real. For some companies. I don't think they right. work very well for the majority of the companies. I think it works exceptionally well for Google right. because people search and they go there. And Mahalo is similar in that sense. Yeah, so it can work for gateway services. Yes. But there's way too many other companies who think that, oh, well, it works for Google. They make billions of dollars. So it's going to work for me if I just get X number of pages. I agree with you. There's no, people, no. A lot of people just assume, hey, my advertising is going to work. And they right. have no idea what it means to sell advertising. Right. I agree. Um, I think that I, you, know, you make a compelling argument. I see both sides of it because uh, when I was your age, I'm 10 years older than you, I think. I'm 39, you're 30. Yep. When I was on, and this is your first company you're on. Yes. And you've been doing the company for how many years? I've been involved with 37 Signals for nine years. Right. You were very attached to this. You couldn't, yeah. even, you couldn't sell it. Somebody comes and offers you guys $50 million for this. Can you sell it? I would turn that down. Somebody offers you a disproportionate amount for the company. I don't know what the number is that's disproportionate, but if the company makes $10 million a year and somebody offers you 10 times revenue, which would be disproportionate, you wouldn't take it. Nope. Because the thing is, A, what am I going to do then? B, if, and we're well, not talking about- What are you going to do with 30 million, 10, 30, 20, 30 million dollars? The difference- I have some ideas. So Tyler, what would you do with 30 million dollars, <laughs> 10 million dollars? The thing is- that You've got a whole chat room of people going, no. oh my God, what do you, should you would give up making some disproportionate amount of- I would revenue? give up taking a single payday over having uh, a steady uh, profit income stream that I believe will run for the next 20 years. Interesting. Yes. What if the profits of the 20 years you could get all in one day? No thanks. Really? What am I going to do then? Like, what am I going to do then? So you're is scared of what you would actually do with your time. You're, you're afraid of what it would mean to be truly independent in terms of your wealth. I'm already independent enough. Like if, right. if I didn't But is it to scary work, to you? It would be scary to you to sell it or is it an emotional thing? It's a practical thing in many ways. It's okay. a practical thing of a, once you get to a point where you've made some definition of enough. Right. Like the difference between having, uh, let's say, $2 million in the bank and having $10 million in the bank is very small compared to the difference between having like $15,000 in the bank and having $1 million in the bank. I agree. So the big jump 
already happened. Right. Like the big jump is over. Everything from here on is very incremental. Like how much better is my life going to be if I have a private jet? Right. Versus having a job that I really care about, a company I really care about. Mm. Um, like I'd much rather have that. Like the material things that comes after so a certain So you, you have a personal uh, love of the brand so much that getting a disproportionate payday would make it very hard for you to sell them. You're that connected to them and you enjoy it that much. I enjoy working too much. And I think everybody does. I think yeah. that's why you're back. Like this is your third Yeah. Enterprise. I can't like, stop. You, exactly. And so, this week in startups and right. this week in network is the fourth. And right. TechRise exactly. 50 was the fifth. Exactly. An angel investing in seven companies. So year. people don't stop. So no. this notion that you're going to sell it for some big payday and then you're going to retire to some mojito island and just you're going to sit there on the beach and enjoy everything. It works for three to six months. Oh, yeah, but what I'm and saying, you're I, I'm not saying you, you have to give, hang it up. What I'm saying is if you could get all 20 of those years, no non-competing, you could start another idea the next day, would you do it? No, because first of all, like if you're not working on your best idea right now, right. you're doing it wrong. Mm. Like you should just be quitting. You should be working on your best idea right now. So I think I'm working on my best idea right now. Like, if I'm going to sell that, I'm going to have to work on my second best idea. Interesting. Like, why would I want to do that? Like, mm. if I can just work but, on but, my best but idea. But if you have this great of an idea now, don't you think ideas, you'll have many more? Do you think that this idea at the age of 20-something that you had is the best idea you'll ever have, David? Or do you think it's possible that you'll have better ideas in the future? A, I think there's a very good chance that um, it is the best idea. Really? So, like so at, 20, look, at 25, you came up with your best idea? Really? Very likely. I'm not saying that's for certain. I'm saying if you look at any of the big companies right now, tons and tons of them are still banking off their best idea of 20 years ago. If you look at Microsoft, where are they making their money? Office, Windows. All the other bullshit that they did in the last 20 years didn't matter. Didn't like, add up. Exactly. Xbox, Zune. Yeah, uh, it's singles it's and specs. doubles. Exactly. Singles and Versus doubles. Versus having like the, the, the big, big idea. franchises. Right. And I think that's well, Bill exactly Gates' second idea, giving away all, all his money and solving malaria and all these other things, pretty good idea. That is a good idea. But it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, most companies, and I think to a large extent, most people have a few good ideas. Are you a capitalist, a socialist? A what is your politics? A capitalist. Absolutely. Absolutely I, capitalist. I want to get as, as much profit out of what I'm doing as I can. Because I think. So you like money? Oh, yeah. No problem with money. No problem with There's money. There's no like hidden communist no, socialist no, 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 agenda no, no. in what you're saying. No, no. You're no. not, are you a like Ayn Rand guy or something? Is there some objectivist I, thing that I need to know about? No, I don't think so. Okay. Like, I, I, I love money and I love profit, or I should say I love profits because they lead to money. Right. But much more than that. It's not just because of that. I believe in profits is the main way of identifying businesses that are doing great for the world. So that's the, that's the feedback of, mechanism. Exactly. It's, a it's feedback. the feedback loop. You're doing something great for the world. Money comes in. Yes. And if it's profitable money, as opposed to just, you know, right. having a loss. Right. just being eaten up by, right. by expenses, that's then it's feed, not working. Then it's the feedback's not working. Yes. And I think there's just too much of that. There's too much focus on, Interesting. first of all, revenues, which I don't think mean anything. Mm. If, if you can't turn your revenues into profits, who the hell cares? You're just spinning right. your wheels. Right. Um, so it's not only the... Uh, the, the lack of revenues that disgust you, it's a lack of earnings in some cases. Yes, and there's so many examples of this. I'd much, much rather have a company that has, let's say, $2 million in revenues and are making $1.5 million in profits rather than have, and there's plenty of these companies, $100 million in revenues and they're losing uh, $10 million last season. Interesting. Like, there's so many of these high revenue um, high headcount, high page views, high all of this stuff that doesn't lead to the thing that matters. Mm. When For me, business is all about profits. Right. All the other stuff is just factors that lead into that. So if you can't get to the profit part, you're doing it wrong. I don't give a shit how many people you hire. I don't give a shit about how many revenues you have. I don't give a shit about whether you're public or not. Right. None of it matters if it doesn't lead to profits. And it's, it's sometimes it's infuriating to me because right. it's such a simple idea. Like, right. the foundation of business is to generate profits. How can we even talk about anything because, else if we don't deal with that as the because baseline? Because there has been a, an outside factor that has come into the industry that has changed what the goal is, and that's the exit. It's and fucked build, it up. It ha you might say it fucked it up. You might say also it's created another liquidity event. It's created another way, another dynamic in the industry. So it is a, a weird dynamic that has occurred in capitalism that... The goal doesn't have to be profits. The goal could be scale that somebody else needs to, and that they have a revenue machine for. So Think Weblogs Inc. Need. was making, uh, I, 
I don't know if I'm allowed to say all these things, but anyway, the month that we got bought, we were making like $100,000 or something. We, the business was sold for 30 times what it was projected to make the next year. Massively right. disproportionate. Right. Massively disproportionate. Do you actually think they made that money back? Mm, I don't think so. No, I think they have actually now with the having Gadget Auto Blog at the scale that they're doing it. Yeah. But how long time did it take to make? Do you think that was six a or seven or eight years investment then? Like for versus, them? Yeah. Or for, or, or for me to take the money? No, for you to take the money, all the power in the world. Like right. Like all the power in the world. And the way I look at it, I got to take care of my family. Totally. Totally. My mom. I'm not, my I'm dad. Not, I'm right. not uh, like anybody who's presented with. Uh, a buyout of some sort. Right. If they choose to take it, that's what they want to do. I have no qualms Absolutely. about that at all. Like that's for them too. Like yeah. for me, I want to stay in the game. That's me. It's not right. because and it's I'm better. still in the game. But you got a different idea. Exactly. But what I'm annoyed about is how often uh, big companies end up buying these ideas for outside profits. Like it doesn't. It didn't make financial right. sense at the time. Right. Like, if you're buying something for 30, 40, I don't know how many times revenues. Right. It doesn't make financial sense. They think they can do some magic trick. Yeah. And then they can turn so it into AOL a AOL buying Bebo. They bought it for 850 right. million. They overpaid by 500 million to the right. next highest bidder. I heard a rumor, right. which is pretty crazy when you think about it. The they had like a sealed bidding contest uh -huh. and they overbid they by bid 850. And I heard, I don't know this for certain, right. uh, that the next highest bid was 350. They overbid by five half a billion dollars. Now the business and is actually, tanking, and it's got less uniques than Mahalo. Exactly. They overbid by 850 million. They overbid so by even like yeah, 800 million probably. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so interesting. With the with the weblogs Inc. acquisition, they did grow it from a hundred thousand when I left. It was you know doing a million dollars a month, so they did make their money back eventually. And that premise was there. They had massive amounts of uh, advertisers. Right. They had didn't have the inventory. We had the inventory, but not the advertisers. Peanut butter, chocolate, boom, it worked. Uh, so you you're not, you're very not, you're not often that. it doesn't work. Very often the big bio doesn't work. Like. Some company gets away with spending years being not profitable, spinning their wheels, right. because somebody else is going to buy them. Then somebody else does buy them, and then they just end up squandering that. There's, it's a graveyard of acquisitions. Right. The vast majority of acquisitions do not pan out. Right. Yet, still, people keep on buying it, and it feeds into the feedback loop that people build, keep building. Why does that building. happen? Why, does it, why do people, why do they buyers keep buying? Delusions of think? grandeur. They think that they're special. They think that this time it's going to work. Right. They, like, some sense of insanity here. Like, right. we have this event occurring over and over again, and it keeps not panning out, but now it's going to be But different. once in a while, you do have a YouTube or again, Google bought AdSense. Uh, right. Once in a while, you have a Powerball. Yahoo once in a while, somebody wins overture. the lottery. Is that a good way to run a business, betting on the lottery? And in the sense of YouTube, still a bad business. They have not made their money back. They will. It's pretty clear they're going to. I would not. I think they have like three or four hundred million in revenue. I, I was running this idea in my head when I was thinking back earlier from last time these things get, went through. Hotmail, for example. Do you think Hotmail ever made the six hundred and fifty million back, plus the running cost, plus the engineering, plus everything? Microsoft's web business has run at a loss for a long time. They've exactly. run, I, they've, I think if you go to Business Insider, Henry Blodge has shown Another that year by year. Of paying a shit ton of money to There's somebody. There's been studies that say M and A net net has been a loss. Right. Just like VC has been a loss for the uh, past 10 years. The top VCs have had tremendous returns. The mid-tier have, have been flat, which is a smaller group, small group of people, I should say. So there's this tiny group of people who have tremendous. Right. The Sequoias, the Benchmark, whatever, uh, Kleiner Perkins. Then you have a bunch who sort of go sideways and return you know, a decent amount, but not, nothing to write home about. And then there's the vast majority of that either negative returns or negative compared to the market. Right. That model is broken. That's your point. M&A is broken as well. You're correct. We have a broken system that works best for who? For the guy who gets to sell it, like on the hot chair. So we have, which, which is just we so have a perverse system. Yes, That's that benefits the entrepreneur. But the entrepreneur is the one's benefiting. Let's not screw it up, people. Delete the episode. Do not tell anybody that this this situation works best for the entrepreneurs who are pulling them. You're right. In it's some a ways, bubble you're right. game. It's it a, is a bubble game. It's a fake game. And I think it doesn't have to be because there's an alternative, which is just to build a fucking profitable business, which is supposed to be the gold in the end anyway. Right. So can't we just start there instead? Can't we just say, like, instead of having all these uh, entrepreneurs, starter guys, chasing this bubble idea, hmm. which, like, I think there's some sense of moral obligation here. Like, I'm, it's not about socialism. It's about furthering capitalism. Furthering the world, right? Increasing wealth overall, right. like all these bubble games, they don't end up increasing wealth overall. 
Like, there's one guy who's going to make out well. The management team does extraordinarily well. Right, in a single event. But, right. And, and you can't fault them for, for taking that, but as a whole game, looking at the whole system, it doesn't seem right. A lot of wasted capital. Yes. A lot of people getting laid off constantly. Right. Uh, and big, huge swings. Boom and bus cycle. Boom yes. and bus cycle. And it doesn't have to be that way. There's you a take a more measured approach, go. which is Europe, which has how many of the leading internet companies? I, I don't think it has to be a false dichotomy between those two things. So it's you, not don't, either you don't you think get Europe, the bubble or you get... Well, Europe, you would say, is non bubbleicious I mean, they don't, they specifically crush the bubble. They don't allow bubbles right. there because of the factors we talked about, like the risk is on you. Right. Here in the United States, it's insane bubble mania, no risk, swing for the fences, raise lots of money. Is there something in between? Absolutely. I think that's what we're doing. We're in the U.S. Like, yeah. I moved to the U.S. in part because of the capitalist system here, which is, like, lower taxes and uh, LLC and easy ways to get going. But we still went for the profit route. Right. We still went for, all right, we're just going to so build a sustainable business. So there is some, and you guys did raise some capital. Jeff Bezos is an investor and it loves this company. raising of capital in the sense of, let's spend this capital to build a business. Right. By the time we raised capital, this was a, let's take Safety something net. off the table. Oh, okay. So he, that went to the founders. Exactly. It, it didn't go as, uh, it wasn't for funding the business. Right. The business was funded, doing well. Yep. You Been guys profitable got taken, since day one. So taking a little bit off the table, you don't have to worry. Exactly. Great thing. And you, what do you think of that as a, you know, you have a lot of these founder shares going on, right? A lot of people, they called it Series F or something, where the founders get to take money out of the, on the table. Yeah. Series I, I, C I round, D a, round. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to get into the whole round thing in the right. first place. But yeah, selling a, a stake of whatever you have without giving up control, without getting into the... VC nonsense of uh, liquidation preferences and all these other mm. bullshit you have to do when you do regular term sheets right. um, can be a good idea. Right. And hopefully encourage you to stay in the game longer. Hmm. Interesting. You know, there's a very, there are two different schools here. One is go big, go for the big exit. Another one, you're saying, go I don't for think the profits. It, I, I don't think that's how it is because I don't think the, the going for the profits is ultimately the going for the big two. Like all the big. Well, Jeff Bezos, your investor. I mean, Amazon is known for not being particularly profitable. Right now, it's pretty damn profitable. Uh, Ten years later, and its yes. return on investment has not been so great. Right. Uh, you know, long haul, but it has become a very important transformative I, business. Yes, I agree. It's just that it. If you look at those singular events, where yeah. there's, there's the, going to be the Facebook, there's going to be the Amazon. Right. It, that's not a category of businesses. Right. You can't fucking just look at the all stars and then say yeah. this is how the system then works. But isn't that how the system works? I mean, there's no more mom and pop uh, shops anymore. It's, there's Walmart. There's, you know, Whole Foods, not a bunch of local groceries. That's why we're here. Because the wonderfulness of the internet allows right. for so many more diverse, much smaller businesses in a much easier way. And small is, is sort of like talking down to it in some sense. Right. There's just as much potential for any one of these to make it big someday. Like, right. I have delusions of grandeur. I think right. that Third Gemma Signal is going to be a huge company in terms How of... How big could it get? Could it be no Microsoft? Limit. Absolutely. How I, many more products do you have to create? I mean, how much how many, how many products did Microsoft have? Two. We have four. We're already right. twice as good as Microsoft. So you have to cut two. <laughs> right, actually. Cut the loser. Right. So you have um, three and focus more on those. When, when you have a product, that's a product where you... you you don't have to scale one to one, like consultant businesses or very labor intensive businesses. You can't build it large without getting a huge sales force. Something like a product like ours, there's no connection self -serve. here. Self-serve. Self-serve. Like when Scales we get beautifully. another 10,000 customers, we don't have to hire another 500 key account but managers. to get into a big corporation, IBM or something like that, you get those people signing Who up on their own? Who cares about that? Well, so that might be a site license that might be worth $100 million. No thanks. Fortune 500, do you know how many companies that is? 500. 500. Right. Right. How many companies are there in the world? Right. Millions. Yeah, I'd much rather focus on the millions of companies that are out there rather than just the 500. Because well, what about why, why not both? Why not take the $100 million contract? Because it changes your company. Because you can't run the kind of company we do right. and sell to the Fortune 500. Ah. Selling to the fi Fortune 500 takes forever in a day. It mm -hmm. takes strippers and stakes. It takes key account managers. It takes bending over backwards. Did you say strippers and stakes? Yes. What are we doing after the show? We're going to Vegas? <laughs> right. uh, you're right. It it's does. a totally different model. You just don't want it that lifestyle. Yeah. You don't want that grind. I don't want that grind, and I think it's less profitable. Interesting. Oracle or Salesforce might disagree. Look at Salesforce. Salesforce is a great example. I, I think uh, Mark Benioff is a great guy. I met yeah. him a few times. I think horrible business. I would not trade. If we did an even one-to-one -one switch, really? like, he gets 37 signals, I get Salesforce. 
No? No effing way. Look at their fucking numbers. Their profitability is like 7%. Right. That's uh, fucking terrible. On a big number. I don't care. That's still so much smaller. Wait, but they make more. They make more revenue than you, and you could take it over. But and not make enough it 20%. many times versus the bullshit they have to deal with of uh, running a mm. three thousand. I don't even know how many people there. Thousands are there. of people. Thousands, thousands and thousands of people. of people being on the market. Blah 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 blah. Well, the truth Quality is, of life. I would not. One of the one shoes. of the great things about capitalism is that you can because of this open source system of capitalism uh -huh. and how it works and all the different funding that is available from angel investors to loans to venture capital to building off revenues, you, you can make this any type of you know, a game you want to play. You could have a lifestyle business. You could have something. You could it, ha it, it, it could I, be more. I'm not saying you have a lifestyle business, but you could, you could have a lifestyle business. Yes. I could make a lifestyle business right now. You have a lifestyle business if you wanted to just out of writing right. your blog, mm -hmm. writing books, and doing speaking gigs. Yep. That could be a lifestyle business that makes you half a million dollars a year yep. and for the rest of your life. And guess what? 90% of the time, you're off. Yeah, totally. Like that, Why not do that instead of 37 Signals? Because I enjoy the 37 Signals part more. So the key is And I, I doing don't believe what in the love. whole uh, lifestyle. Like, what interests me is scalable businesses hmm. where there's no connection between the amount of capital or resources or whatever that goes in and the hmm. amount of profits that comes out. Yeah. Like, there is no reason that 37 Singles today could not be 100 times as big mm -hmm. with only adding, let's say, another 10, 15 people. Interesting. I have come up with a statistic myself that I am tracking, which is the number of unique visitors per employee in your company. And looking at something outscale, like look at uh, Craigslist. Like what, they have like 40 people 40 and they're people. like the number four website in the world? Okay, somebody in the chat room do math. There's 40 people working at Craigslist. How many uniques do they have a month? And tell us what the number per month is. Right. Tell us what the number for Facebook is. How many employees does Facebook have right now? Like 1,500 yeah, or 1,000? Like and then how many uniques do they have a month? 100 million, 200 million, something like that? Let's get those numbers, right. put them in here. So unique visitors per employee. No, it's actually- I think that's a much more interesting- It is an interesting number because you know what that shows efficiency. Right. It's like revenue per employee. That's sort of what I- Or earnings per employee. Yes, exactly. Not Your earnings, earnings but... per employee must be off the charts. Yes. If you guys make- $5 million a year and 16 employees, that would be an extraordinary number. Half a million dollars per employee or something, or 300. Right. That's the number I care about getting as large as possible. Hmm. I have no interest in just adding more people to it. Fascinating. We, this show is going to go five hours. Tyler, you're <laughs> listening to all this. Do you have anything to add to this crazy discussion? I'm curious. Just, it seems like a, Europe, a slightly European perspective, and I wonder if, if he attributes his perspective to having come from Europe. Interesting. Absolutely not. So Jason Fried, who's uh, our partner in the business, he's from Chicago. He has exactly the same focus on business. Um, and in my mind, I have a more capitalist approach than most so-called capitalists here in the U.S. Right. Again, because it's about old the school capitalism. Yes. You're, old, you're old school capitalism. Oh. Not this warped, distorted, go for the big gold, worry about revs later, right. and get the big exit. You always got the IPO and the exit to to have your to get your stock out. It's a pure form of capitalism. Mark yes. Cuban is very, thinks very much like you. I thought very much like you. I still think like you to a certain extent. I, I do know that. But I do also know that there is this other game going on. There's this other dynamic. There is, and uh, if you have a name like Evan Williams or Mark Zuckerberg at this point or uh, you know, Mark Pincus, mm -hmm. and you can get large amounts of capital for relatively little equity and deploy very big things and go to build massive, massive businesses that are transformative and change the world, you sort of have an obligation to do that in my mind because <laughs> there's so few people on the top of that list who can walk into a venture capitalist or a, you know, whatever, a private equity firm and say, give me 10, 50, 100 million dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make something epic that, wow, if you can do that, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I, it's like a big director. You know? like if you're James Cameron and you can make Avatar, you're saying he should just make an, in, an independent film? No, I, I don't think those things are, are comparable because I think- They're not. They, like, what is it about Twitter that changed the world? It was the simplicity of it. Absolutely. Not the 160 people they have now. Right. Uh, not the lack of revenue. Business could be run on how many people? One. Not even one. Less than one. One oh, person are you could run about that business. Twitter? Twitter. Oh, how many could how run? Many, how many employees know. would your version of Twitter have? What do you not think? Not 160, reasonable? I tell you. Half sure. that. Well, I mean, it, there it's are not data scaling so issues. I don't even know yeah. how. Uh, like, Trust me, when you look at their data scaling issues and you look at like, the fact that Cassandra is in 0.5 and they have to right. basically write code to make it do what they want to do. And right. I mean, there are some challenges in that business, Absolutely. I can tell you. Absolutely. Let's not demean that, for sure. Uh, let's talk about the news, because I can't keep you here forever. You've got to get back to Malibu and surfing or something. Yes. Do you write <laughs> any code now? I do. 
Really? I, I still don't write code. It's, Absolutely. Uh, it, what is your average day like? Tell, take us through your day while we get Mike in here for the news. Um, or week. Whatever. Sure. So I, I do spend uh, a fair amount of time just in our campfire, mm -hmm. keeping up with uh, what people are doing, trying to get people to do simpler stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things we just uh, implemented recently was the notion of the scope hammer. Huh. So we have all these features or extensions we want to make to the, to, to the software. Um, and we have a tendency, even knowing all this thing, we keep on saying no complexity, blah, 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 blah. Right. We often get into it, uh, and it becomes more complex than it needs to be. Sometimes just a role in itself is to just come in and cut down complexity. Let's not do all that. Let's make this simple or feature simpler. So Let's you have to ship. rein people in. Because yeah. their feature creep is just Everybody what happens. feature creeps. Exactly. So that, that's just one example of uh, okay, Mike, some of the stuff we're doing. Uh, so, oh, Mike is here to do the news. All right. Welcome, Mike. Let's play Lon's news thing anyway. Unless we have a, if we have a Mike one, we'll play the Mike one. But Lon has... My God, the, twi the Twitter comments on this show are ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are quoting you. Uh, D. Harmesh says, selling the Fortune 500 takes strippers and stakes. <laughs> I love that one. Um, people saying to you, Giacomo says, love your rock solid approach to building businesses and smacking down at Jason Calacanis. <laughs> it's a smackdown. Uh, Atagarasi, I love the way DHS is correcting the wrong args, and I hate the way Jason is condescendingly saying interesting after each one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky says, great debate. Uh, Paula says, seriously geeky right now. Jason Rubinow's great. Da, da, da. Um, well, some awesome. things never change. Uh, selling to Fortune 500. People love these strippers and stakes. Uh, comment, somebody commenting in Greek. Uh, da, 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 da. Amazing to see two legends in the game. That's very nice of people to say. Um, it's also so much more fun this time. Like, I don't like coming on shows where everybody agrees. Like, no, of the course interesting not. part is when there's different opinions. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's pushback and so I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I, I, I know I, I think things change as you get through your career, right? And so you would argue that maybe when you guys got to exit, life changed a little bit. You didn't have to worry, right? That's it what does, I is a little freeing. It, it is, but not really. Like it's the thing you think about um, that day, that week, right. that month. And then it just goes in the background, I which know, is why I'm actually thinking like since I've been with 37 Singles for almost a decade now, stuff isn't that different. Right. And I don't want it to be that different. Like, you enjoy I what like you do. That. Right. Exactly. But it is nice that you don't have to worry about the rent this year or next year. And sure. do you remember what it was like when you had to worry about that and had to hustle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not. I'm which not is gonna better? Argue. Absolutely, it's better not to have to worry about these things. But the thing is, that event comes so much sooner than thinking about the billion dollars. Right. Like, the not worrying about rent event is like, what, half a million or something? As soon as you have that, you could live for years and yes. not worry about that yes. anymore. So taking that... So you are not I'm a materialistic guy. You don't care if you live in 1,000 square feet or 10,000. Not your oh, thing. Oh, I, I care. Again, you do. Like, I care about the profits. So, no, yeah. I, I'm not, I don't have a fancy for big houses, but I absolutely want 37 Singles to be as massively and outrageously profitable as it's... Why? Is it because, it, because you want the money? Is it because you want the, the success? Or just you want to have done it? Is it the scorecard? Is it just the, the, the great feeling that I made a business that has $100 million in profits? What is it that drives you? Like, as we talked about earlier, I think it's like a measure of success of the impact you're having on the world. Huh. If you are outrageously It is a scorecard. It is the scorecard score in sort of the global scorecard of how is your business Absolutely. affecting So you are a true capitalist. I agree with you. Respect uh, for that. But also, I, the money is nice. It's nice to have money. So if you yes. wind up making a billion again, dollars, like, you're not going to buy a jet. Uh, probably I would. Like, right. At that point, it like, but that's just not the driving factor. If it gets to that I'll point, I'll tell you that's what. Right. I'm going to translate for everybody what is actually going on during this program. 37 Signals is in the middle of a bidding war between Microsoft and Google, <laughs> and he is jacking up the price, convincing them how much he loves this business and running it every day. Uh, it's an awesome discussion, and we're going to have to have you back on the program to talk more about your story because we didn't even get into how you met. Jason Freed, and we didn't get into all these different things, but we're going to destroy the audience if we go for four hours. Let's go through some news stories, because if you all did right. this good on the interview, the news stories will be even better. Sure. By the way, do you mention the book on the show? Oh, uh, I didn't really. What? You so have a, you we have, we have a new book out. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. We just uh, released it on uh, Tuesday. It's called Rework. Rework. And we just got word that it's uh, on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. And it's on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So oh, that's and, pretty exciting. And what in the book? How to, how uh, to it's work basically, more efficiently? Like, as I said, I've been working for Thursday Signals for almost a decade. It's all the best experiences 
from uh -huh. that decade distilled into, I think, like 89 essays, very mm. short essays, all about what we think about why not to raise money, uh, why not to hire workaholics, right. um, why to do less, right. why to want to do the competition, all of these things. Actually, I'll tell what we've been talking about here yeah. is in the book in various ways. Right. And we disagree on firing the work, uh, fire the workaholics, and I say, you got to have people who are workaholics. You have to really crush it 70, 60, 70, 80 hours a week because your competitors are going to be doing that. And you say, no, zig, will you zag? Absolutely. And I, this is why I want to be in a business I can be in for the next 20 years. I'm not going to be in a business for the next 20 years where I work 80 hours a week. I agree. You, should, you don't have the competitive spirit to go up against Microsoft's operating oh, system do. or their office suite. We're going up because, against a bunch of their shit. Like, <laughs> uh, like for Basecamp. A huge but you're percentage not going is after refugees Gmail. for SharePoint. You're not going after Gmail. Because that problem doesn't interest me. Right. So I'm but going it also is convenient. It's all convenient that the big problems don't, uh, aren't ones you're interested in. Well, how, how, is, how is managing it? projects not a big project? That's eh, a small thing. And, you're, and, you're, and your software doesn't problem. have a lot of features by your own admission. Sure. That doesn't mean it's not a big problem. But it you're, ma you're making the light software for each category, correct? Like the We're simpler, the simple version. The simple version. I would call it. So light. if you ma if your strategy is to make the simple version of yep. things, then you don't have to work as hard. But if you're going up against a big problem, like I am going to build a car company like Tesla and go against the big boys, right. you're not working 30 hours a week and taking Fridays off because you will get your ass kicked by the people who are. And that's where your logic breaks down. You're not going after Google. You're not launching rockets to the moon. You're launching the simple version of software. That's why you have a simple version of. Do you, know, do you think Google succeeded because somebody worked 80 hours a week? Absolutely, 120. No. And it was right. because they bought AdSense. But they busted their ass. Yes, sleeping under their desk. That's how Yahoo was built. That's how Google was built. That's how Microsoft was built. I do you know the work ethics way. of these people? I think it's terrible. I don't think that's the indicator of their success. I think there's a mistaken correlation I thought you said before here. that the money is the scorecard. They have it much is. more money than you. Absolutely. But so it's not you. because of putting in more hours. Oh, yes, it is. Those guys, they put in tremendous hours. Yes, but that's not the correlation. The correlation mm. is the great execution on a wonderful idea at the right time. Right, but there are competitors. You know how many people had the idea for an operating system? You know how many people had the idea for PCs? Michael yep. Dell beat them because he out hustled them. He was smarter and out hustled them. Bill Gates, smarter and out hustled people. You know what Steve Jobs' work ethic was like during that time period? Tremendous. I, that's, the, the 30 I'm hour not attributing week. that to their success. Yeah. I'm attributing, like, if you're working 40 hours a week, if you are the smarter person who makes better decisions, you are going to win. You're not going to beat me just because you work twice as hard as you as I do. You're you going to beat all me the, because you work smarter. Research, all the research on talent, and if you listen to the book, Talent is Overrated, says the exact opposite. People who work harder and do more deliberate practice beat people. The best players in the NBA, the best piano players, the best chess players are the ones who do deliberate practice. All of the science and technology out there and research that has been done on success and dexterity and different behaviors is done based upon how many hours you work in the 10,000 hours in, Mike, in Malcolm Gladwell's book, it's the exact opposite. You're basing this on the fact that your world experience is building light software. If you built the heavy software and you had real competitors, who's your competitor? You don't have any light competitors. You found a niche, which is awesome for you. We have but you're not solving the big problem. Anyway, I'm going to read the book, and you and Jason are come on, and we're going to do this again. All right. We should do this actually I'm live. For that. It's pretty exciting. Do it live. No. You could be right. I could be wrong. I'll yeah. tell you what you're right about. I'll tell you what you're right about. Likely. <laughs> it is nice to find a very profitable business yes. and coast and make the money. You're not coasting. Well, I'm saying you're not working as hard. That is cool. If you can yes. make that work, if you can find the, you know, work three days a week, four days a week and make triple living, trust me, that's, that's Tyler's whole thing, man. This guy was on the beach trading <laughs> stocks for two hours a day and then he came to work for me and now he's working 70, 80 dollars a day. He wants to get back to Thailand. Look at that guy. <laughs> he was desperate to get back to Thailand. Here's the book. Rework. ASP is poison. Underdo the competition. Meetings are toxic. I agree with that one. Fire the workaholics. Hey, that's for my thing. Am I mentioning this book? Uh, I don't know. I don't oh, know. boy. I, this, I gotta, is, this is absolutely that essay. That is that which essay. Was, uh, Emulate drug thing. dealers. Uh -huh. mm, get people, give them a little bit of the crack. Give them a little bit for free. Yep. Yeah. Uh, pick a fight. You guys did that pretty well. Fight up. You guys were nobodies. You fought with me. You get, No. It's the other <laughs> way around. Um, planning is guessing. I agree with that. I never write business plans. People ask me to write a business plan. I said no. I never Good. write a business plan. Inspiration is perishable. Years. You gotta act on it right now. 
I like that. Uh, okay, yes. Don't take your passion, shove it in the shelf, and uh, I see. This is the thing. I think we're, I think we're more in sync than maybe this interview has uh, has uh, alleged alleged or or demonstrated because. I do think sometimes ASP is poison. Getting things done like immediately and not doing it right is that sort of the point there. Yeah, urgency is overrated. Most things yes. do not need to be done as quickly as you think they need to be done. Mm -hmm. well, you know, see, this is interesting because I do say in my company, like speed is everything for a startup. But mm, I guess it has it to is, do with your company. It is, but it's more of the long term. It's not speed of tomorrow. What matters right. is whether you're putting some good shit out okay. over the okay, course I agree. of a I agree with that. period okay. of time. What I tell people is it's a marathon and a sprint. It's a marathon filled with sprints. It's more a marathon than a sprint. It is more a marathon than a sprint, but I like sprinting a couple of miles in the marathon. Yes. Uh, underdo the competition. I think that's about the feature bloat. Yep. Less features, less I agree, complexity. More elegant. I actually have, that, that is an issue I have as an entrepreneur, doing too many features and pulling back and right. doing the, the ones we do do better. We say uh, do half a product instead of a half-assed product. I like that. Uh, meetings are toxic. I, I only do stand-ups. We have a stand-up rule here. I that's hate meetings. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, we don't have too many meetings here. Which we do stand-ups. You do it for yeah. five minutes. Right. Much Coffee more. table. Much better. Make the decision and move on. Absolutely, because if you make the wrong decision, you'll know quicker, and then you just change yep. it. You just switch back to the other one. The Ab second best decision. Ab absolutely. Much better. Picking a hey, fire. This is turning into be too friendly here. It's becoming a to, love uh, fest. Let's yeah. go to the news. Let's go to the news. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, the big story this week, the Google uh, Viacom dispute. Yes. Uh, new documents were leaked that uh, showed basically... Um, at least alleging that Google has evidence that Viacom itself, with across 16 different marketing agencies and all the, these things, had been posting their own content um, on Google, on YouTube. Um, so, so what do you make of this? Who, who do you believe? Do you believe Viacom? Do you believe Google? Obviously, there's an interdependency between both companies, you know, because uh, Viacom's gotten a lot of publicity for their shows on Google. Yeah. Yet, at the same time, Google was sort of dependent on those. Co that content being on their site yep. as Google was growing. So I wrote a uh, piece back in the day mm -hmm. before I knew Roloff Botha, who was the investor at Sequoia, who's now on my board. And I wrote, talk about uncomfortable, uh, I wrote a post that uh, YouTube is, a, is not a real business. It's a pretty famous post when I, when I had my blog. And I said, there, this whole business is based off of copyright infringement. The reason that they exploded in terms of traffic was in large part, not only, but in large part due to the fact that Saturday Night Live didn't put their clips up. ESPN didn't put their clips up. And now users were putting up clips because they had capture cards, et cetera. And there was like, that sort of was not that big of a deal. Right. They had Flash, so it was easy to do. And they won the search engine rankings. You type something in. If your competition for Lazy Sunday is nobody, you win. And it, that, they just won the SEO war. And it was a build, business built off of in large part, maybe not totally. I don't know what the percentage is. You'd have to, they would know. If you look at all the top videos, though, I just saw a list of the top videos on YouTube. They're all like the history of dance and like yeah, some baby giggling and yes. like there's a huge part of YouTube. Well, the that other is ones just, have been taken down. But there are, if you took, you know, like, I don't know. Some, but then, I mean, then it doesn't really matter. If you can get I well, mean, 250 million people to watch the history of dance and like 150 million to watch a baby giggle, right. like, all right, you got a fair amount of audience there, but just on that. That's true. Uh, but I do think in the early days, a lot of it was based on that sort of people finding stuff on there. I know probably more than half of what I watch on YouTube, even to this day, is not rights cleared, I think. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. I mean, some hey. of it is now being put on by CBS or other people. So, but that doesn't mean that YouTube broke any laws because of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the fact that they are a common carrier and they're just like the phone company. You can't blame the phone company if somebody use, uses a phone call to you know, rob a bank, just like you can't blame a car company if somebody you know, uses a car in a getaway. Like It's not Volvo's fault that the, the robbery happened. It's the robbers. Uh, it's the individuals who put that content up there. It's their fault, and it's YouTube's job to take it down. And also, is that really such a bad thing? There's so many shows that I got to wear off uh, because of YouTube. You yeah. get a clip, you see it, you get hooked, and then you don't want to watch that fucking little yeah. stamp. You want to watch the real thing. Except so now, that, except now it's an HD and, you can hit, and I have a Mac Mini on my 52-inch uh, screen at home and I can full screen it on HD. Sure, but that's not how it was in the beginning. Yeah. Right. But what's interesting, too, is the, the business model. I mean, Hulu, um, people have been questioning the viability of Hulu from a financial standpoint. Right. Do you still think that it's a viable well, the business C, ad the C, support? CPMs on Hulu are higher than CPMs on television. Yeah. You can't fast forward the ads, yeah. and the ads are interactive. You can click. You can get a, a customer lead out of them. And they make you click 
So you absolutely have to look at the logo of the company at the very least and click to start playing again. It doesn't autoplay, right? Yeah. So I watch a lot of Hulu. Hulu is, if, if they could immediately switch everybody to Hulu and get them off of broadcast and satellite and cable, they would do it. That would be a much better delivery mechanism if every time you had to kit your remote control to right. okay through the commercial and there was no fast forwarding. They just can't put that genie back in the bottle for PBRs. Mm -hmm. right. um, but anyway, it's going to be he said, she said, it's going to end in a settlement. Yeah. Google will wind up giving, I, my prediction is Google gives three or four hundred million dollars to Viacom and Viacom uh, gets some other considerations on Google. Which is another ding against YouTube being a successful business. Now they're another three, four hundred million in the hole. They have to earn that back. There is, I think there's a couple of hundred million dollars in escrow from that deal. So I think that maybe two, three hundred million dollars was held back for that deal. Uh, that being said, they built a tremendous business. They were great entrepreneurs. I don't think they broke the law. And I don't think that the evidence coming out says they broke the law. They understood the DMCA, it's common carrier protection, and the, I don't think the entertainment industry acted in good faith in their dealings. And as a matter of fact, I know they didn't act in good faith. They could have just used the tools that YouTube provided to turn off the content as it came out, and they would have right. been fine. Right. Viacom was like, we're not going to use your tools. You're responsible. And it's actually like, that's not meeting them halfway, and that's not true. They're not responsible. It's common carrier. Just like... If I had an FTP company or a, a hosting company, Rackspace or PowerVPS or whoever or EC2 is not responsible for people putting up pirated stuff. They're responsible okay. for taking it down when they find out about it, which is the same for YouTube. The reason why Viacom is so upset, they got left at the altar. They desperately wanted to buy that business. The reason why Viacom fired the head of MTV back in the day is because he didn't buy MySpace. Some of the Redstone doesn't understand the Internet so well, I think, and was kind of pissed off and he couldn't buy YouTube. Therefore, he's suing them. But all people across Viacom were uploading clips constantly. They have all that evidence. It's going to come out. This whole thing is a waste of time. Yeah. They should just give them $100 million and some advertising or something and call it a day. But it, you know, it's, it's run by Sumner. This is one of the things about these big media conglomerates. You know? Sumner Redstone, Rupert Murdoch, Barry Diller. You know, when you have somebody up there who's very principled and who's been in the business for a long time, these old school guys, you steal their content, they're going to the mat. They are not afraid of a lawsuit. They're not afraid of going to spending $25 million on a lawsuit. They've done that their whole career. I mean, these guys are old school, gangster, like, we will fight. They're not, like, going to roll over. Uh, I think that's what Or Google, come up with some better ideas. They could actually use the shit to promote yeah, no, their businesses and so on. I don't think they're interested in that. I think they're interested in, you know, fighting the legal fight and, and getting their revenge on YouTube. Right. That's what this is about. I mean, why is this still going on? It's so yeah, over. It's, it's right. so moot. Like you're saying, this is such an opportunity for them, and they know it's an opportunity for them. So why are they still fighting? Uh, if I was Viacom, if, I, if some of the Redstone put me in charge of digital strategy, this is what I would say to Google. I want $1 billion in AdSense and ads on YouTube uh, for the next 10 years. So I want $100 million per year in free advertising based on this very low CPM. And you know what Google would do? Here you go. And then you know what I would do? I would build competitors to their Google's products and use their own traffic to build my traffic. That would be the way. A scheme brewing here. <laughs> That's what I would do. I mean, I don't mean to advise. Here you go. Message. Somebody, a super fan can cut this. Message to Sumner Redstone and the Viacom team. You are successfully dragging Google and YouTube uh, through the court system. Uh, we understand you feel you're wronged, but there is a bigger picture here. Uh, Google has a massive amount of advertising inventory. You could use that to build many different projects. So instead of having this court case continue on, offer Google the ability to give you $100 million per year in advertising for your software, hardware, music, movies, television shows, cable channels, anything, but specifically internet companies. Go buy a bunch of small inner companies, use the $100 million in advertising to get users for them, and you'll be a lot further along than you would have been if you bought YouTube for $1.6 billion. End of message. Superfan will cut that, and it will wind up at Sumner Redstone's desk. You can be guaranteed of that. Somebody's got his email in the audience. Yeah, now okay, the show's well, getting bigger. You got a big, we got a big fan base for the show. So. And uh, the new site that just launched? I mean, This weekend? Looks yeah. pretty good. Uh, people are... It's like 75,000 people downloading every episode right now in the first two weeks, I think. That kid, it's yeah. amazing. It's getting popular. You know why? Because when you type in startup, it's the only thing that comes up. There's no competition. <laughs> I mean, that's really, I mean, when you find 
a vertical where there's not being serviced. I mean, I think a lot of your products fit in this. It's like yep. you were the first guys to have web-based, cloud-based services. I mean, you were cloud before there was cloud. Uh, so, like, oh my God, this is a dream come true. You know, Basecamp. I remember when that was a long time ago when Basecamp came out. I was like, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. 94? 2004. 2004. I was like, 94. What? <laughs> uh, okay, next story. Right, another story. So, Kindle for Mac was released this week. Um, but basically allows you to sync uh, between your Kindle device to your Mac. We've had the uh, iPhone app for a while. Um, and I think this is interesting because we have the iPad about to be released. Yes. And the new iBook store, mm. which essentially has this, the same type of offering. Um, how do you think this will work? Do you think Apple will approve an application for the iPad, for the Kindle store? H how do you think that dynamic will play out? They absolutely have to. If Apple does not, it's a major antitrust issue. And it would be major, major um, bad mojo for them with consumers. A lot of the, the same people who are going to buy a tablet are ones who have a Kindle. And if Apple makes it impossible for you to move your Kindle stuff over there, they're going to get sued by Amazon or other people. It's going to look really bad. Antitrust people. It'd also people, just be stupid. It'd be what stupid. does Apple make their money on? Selling you a freaking iPad for $700. Why would you not want all the reasons in the world to buy a $700 iPad. So getting all the Kindle content is like a gift. Like it works for both parties. Yeah. Apple want to sell hardware. That's where they make their money. Like most of their software is either giving away for free or really cheap. And uh, Amazon wants to sell more books. It's full win-win around. The only thing that's going to lose here is that the Kindle hardware is going to lose. Like, yes. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of Kindle buyers around. It, well, it's going to be interesting. because See, I haven't held. Have you held the iPad uh, nope. yet? I haven't held it. But from what I'm told, and this is from Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher, like, it's heavy. And from what I understand from people who have Kindles, it's smaller and lighter. I don't know. People in the chat room, tell me exactly what the weight specs are versus these two things. But I think it's significant. And so if it's, you know, you're on a flight, and i got to have this big, heavy Mac product. But think the about color it screen when the battery having, dies. Having uh, multiple devices. The thing is, if I bring a Kindle, I have a Kindle. I have both of them. Mm. If I bring one of those, I'm also bringing my laptop. So you're not getting that um, weight. A, a crippled laptop, yes, but you, right. uh, you can check your email. Right, exactly. And you or can surf the web. Programmer, or do any of the yeah. other things you write something. Like when you bring an iPad, I don't have to also bring my laptop. Right. You have one device. And I think that's just going to win out. I'm, I'm interested to see if that will actually work because I, I need a full keyboard because I write thousands of words a day. Yeah, that's going to be the big thing. I, you I, can this whole, I mean, my thing. iPhone is just like, so, I can't use an iPhone for email. It is so annoying. Like, I have to use a Blackberry where I can really pound out. I actually, I, I thought that in the beginning, and now I've gotten really fast on the iPhone keyboard. Ugh. So Every I email I get from much. an iPhone user, misspellings. Tons of misspellings. And it, 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 ugh, I can't take it. And, I mean, it would be nice if the iPad had a USB port. I mean, I, you're an Apple fanboy, right? You love Apple products. Absolutely. Apple all the way. It is a little frustrating sometimes, Steve, without, like, you know, That's the, what the I control love of the app store? I, well, that part, I think they're absolutely wrong. Right. But most of the parts are like not having enough ports and so on. Like, I'm a huge fan of the uh, MacBook Air. That's People are ranting and raving about, oh, it only has one USB port and so on. That's exactly why I love Apple. Yeah. I love that Apple are cap a company capable of making hard choices. Right. Which is, all right, fuck it, let's drop the floppy drive. There's going to yeah. be all these people up in arms. Right. No well, CD-ROM. We're going to charge a hat. And which, yeah, exactly. Air doesn't have a CD drive. I love it. Exactly. That's I never exactly why it's small, it's thin. Yeah. They're willing to make compromises. Right. Um, and when you take a port, if you really want, you can get a, right. uh, a splitter. Totally. If you have to. However, it is frustrating sometimes, you have to admit, with Apple products. The store is frustrating. The fact that you can't use any MP3 player with iTunes. I mean, there is, you just take it too far. I, I, absolutely. The control part takes overhand sometimes. I think on the Apple or in the App Store, it's, it's just bad. But on the whole, I, I still appreciate the offering. You haven't tried an Android phone yet? Nexus One or anything? I've uh, seen people use it, and that alone was enough to turn me off. Really? What do you like about it? It's just, it looked like a programmer did it. Yeah. And like, not I'm elegant. a programmer. Non elegant, sort of, everything just didn't feel right. Like, mm -hmm. Apple just has this aesthetic and this precision that's just uncanny. Nobody mm -hmm. else cares so much about the totality of the experience. I mean, they as left for out. Steve Jobs. They did leave out cut and paste for how long? I didn't care. Like two years. I mean, it made me a little crazy because I'm cutting and pasting paragraphs. I'm trying to do an email. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Let alone URLs. You had to, you, it's like, oh, you can't. Oh, you have a URL you want to retweet? Oh, no, no. But I think this memorize was, the Bitly. This was. This was. I'm literally <laughs> trying to memorize a Bitly to retweet a URL. But before. this was the perfect point of like 
consumers will go for less. When yeah. it's better designed, they will go with somebody who's under the make sacrifices, yes. And yeah. the iPad, just one of our super fans here, 1.5 pounds, and the Kindle, 10 ounces. Thank you, Greg Minton. So it's, it's twice as heavy. I think the biggest, the interesting thing for me is, how, you know, whether it's a, consu a consumption device, obviously, how it's going to be as a, you know, productivity advice. Um, it's not going to be much of a productivity device. It'll be, it's yeah. going to be surfing the web, reading books, listening to music. Yeah. Which is when most people do most of the time. Yeah, most people yeah. consume. You're not going to be typing a lot of emails on it. You're not going to be writing a lot of code on it. If you do, you're going to bring a keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it'd be a massive. Uh, the other thing is, I don't think it's a great content creation device, which I thought was the leaving out the camera part was I thought was particularly weird because I thought that Skype and video conferencing would be brilliant on this thing. You know, like and B2. I guess so. You're going to get all of us dopes to pay for it twice. Yes. Uh, okay, keep going. Last all story. Right. Last story. So another sort of Apple-related story. Uh, Spotify CEO Daniel Ek uh, announced at South by Southwest some new um, data on, on his service, Spotify, the music downloading streaming service. Uh, it's in six countries now, 320,000 paid subscribers, 7 million users. It's in closed beta in the U.S. Um, I know you've talked about this before. I have Spotify. I have a press account. You do have an account. Yeah. I'm unfortunately, I'll don't give have you account. my login. You nice. can try it. Um, will iTunes ever offer an on-demand downloading yes. service, and, and when do you think it's they'll imminent. do it? Eminent. It's imminent. I, I, my guess is this year you will have that. Uh, Flat rate subscription, get access to everything. I have Rhapsody. I'll tell you, it, it's 12 bucks a month. I have Rhapsody. I had Napster for 6 or 7 bucks a month, and I have um, uh, Spotify. Mm -hmm. And I do not buy music anymore, very rarely. If I really love something and I want to listen to it at the poker table, maybe I will. If you want to listen to it in the car, but in the car I have satellite radio. That's fine for me. When I'm on a plane, I listen to audiobooks from Audible. And when I'm at home, I have a Sonos system where I pull up Rhapsody. I pick a genre. Well, now that I got the kid, I'll pick you know kids music, and it's got it all there organized. So when you pick children's music, it's like here are the most important top artists, and it tells me these are the 20 top artists. I didn't have to go do any research. It was just there. And then I pick the top artists. I listen to. Go. Oh, that sucks. Then I pick the next one. Oh, that is pretty good. Then I listen to music with my daughter. Or I go to Pandora, and I pick Dire Straits, and I play my channel. And Rhapsody mm -hmm. it. So it's obviously a much better user experience. Much better than collecting a library and having to organize it. Think about how much collective time has been wasted on CDs and collecting them and ripping them. It's so much easier to have everything at your fingertips. The cost, $12 a month, is uh, $150 a year. Yeah. $150 a year is 10 CDs. 10 CDs, which is like that, or Every album ever known to man. The only thing you give up is portability. But you'll have Pandora. The, the Tesla Model S has 4G in it. You can 4G. listen to Pandora in your car. It's built into the Tesla Model S. It's 3G and 4G in the dashboard. You can't buy the car without it. I mean, I guess you could not get the subscription. So streaming is going to be it. That's it. It's over. Yeah. yeah I mean, no been... more buying of music. The idea of buying music, I think, is going to go away. I mean, the only thing for me is I'm, I'm a huge, I, all my playlists on iTunes built on ratings, Play counts so Spotify it, much better playlists. Yeah, there's, there's a playlist UK site, and I got Bob Dylan covers in other languages, and I was like, this is incredible. And Spotify has all the German albums, all the you know albums from Denmark, all the albums from France. So like I'm listening to people doing German versions, which is not German covers in, of Bob Dylan. <laughs> you may not want to listen to, but at least I know I've heard them. But French. I mean, I'll tell you something, Bob Dylan's songs, folk songs sound really good in French. Uh, and I, you can't get that on Rhapsody. You can only get that on Spotify. Right. And you can't find that in the iTunes store. I, I don't know where to yeah, look. Yeah, the iTunes recommendation engine is just terrible. Like the genius yeah. feature is just garbage. Um, it is so. so, are you on any of these services? No. And, but I also, I wouldn't bet against them over the long term. Over the long term, we're all going to have internet available all the time. Yeah. Like for me, my personal music is just, I listen to a smaller set over yeah. and over again. Right. So, I don't know, but um, I mean, it's obviously the way to go. It's not one, of, it's just like something like uh, EC2. Yeah. Like, we don't use it right now. We actually went back from EC2 on some things. Why did you do that? Because it's speed? It's cheaper. Cheaper. So, I agree with that. We have 250 servers at Mahalo in two locations. It's much cheaper for us to do that than have managed hosting or right. run it on a cloud. cloud. You have a so, very, I think when you exactly. get very large. Yes. That's exactly what we found. We have, like, uh, especially for data, like, we do, we're not going to use S3 as the main thing anymore because right. we could just do it so much cheaper ourselves. But that's just a lacking indicator. Like, it's a function I, I of time. I think the top sites have to 
have a hard time using the cloud except for expandable tasks right. or something. Right. So some part of the application you can put in there. But, but it's, it's going to be there. It's obvious that it doesn't make sense for all of us to run our own data centers. They've so got over to the next do something with the cost at the high end. Right. It seems like they won't. Do, are the reason that they're not doing that in cloud, we have to watch this week in cloud computing, but um, is the reason they're not doing that on the high end because they don't want to have that pricing go down to the low end for the smaller clients? I don't know exactly what it is. And some of it is when you already have system administrators, mm -hmm. you're already paying for that functionality of having yes. a human on yes. board to do it. Like, they got to pay somebody to do it. So, mm. like, it gets cheaper for you when you just look at the hardware cost. If we start factoring in all salaries on it, maybe it's not cheaper. But we need these people anyway. Right. So That's the other thing, too, is the technology moves so quickly that, it, you know, your, your ISP or your cloud hosting company, they're probably not going to be screwing around with Cassandra right now. They're going to be busy with Hadoop from two years ago. They're always going to yeah, be... Yeah, that's some of it. For us, it was just a matter of cost. Just okay. looking at how much does it cost to store one gigabyte. Right. If we're going to do it ourselves with the most aggressive pricing we can get from the vendors versus putting on S3, better to do it ourselves. But S3 still worked for the... Like, we've been running S3 for the last, what, two or three years? It was awesome. Like, it's a great way to build your business. You don't go out and buy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of hardware on day one. You'd be a moron. So now you're buying all this hardware, huh? We, exactly. We just mm. wrote some very nasty checks for a ton of hardware because we're now at the point where it makes sense that we can make a big capital expenditure. And didn't, did, did EC2 want to play ball with you and lower the price or no? They were just like, um, you can't go any lower? Part of that was just the, it's not quite there yet. The instances were not quite large enough. There's a bunch of concerns on that. Um, but on, on S3, part of what I like about S3 and those services is it's not hackle pricing. Like, mm. I fucking hate dealing with enterprise vendors. Oh, the like, worst. Every single oh, invoice worst. we got. I can't take it. Like, the <sighs> numbers are ridiculous. CDNs? Like, Ugh. Exactly. Can you just give me the price? Right. No. We ha let's have a phone call. Exactly. Let's and then we've got to hackle back and forth until it's How many of months what you do you said. want to? Commit to right. none. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's like trying to get double click to give you a deal. It, oh, yeah. I hate it. So it's so much better. Like the cloud model obviously is better. It's just a matter of when the finances. This is why I love Google as a company. They're just like you can use our service. Yep. Or you can leave. Yes. Or you can come back. Or you can turn it on and off three right. times in one day. And, and you don't mind. have to talk to anybody. And you don't have to talk to anybody. Just give me my goddamn service, and I'm out. It's so much easier. Uh, and you know what's easy too is WebSpy. Thank you to WebSpy for sponsoring the show. Monitor all your activity on your network. Speaking of networks, uh, monitor what's going on with your mail servers, your web host, analyze uh, for traffic levels, patterns, errors, and more. It is a total log analysis solution. Uh, and make sure you thank the sponsors. It's a really great idea. If you're a fan of the show, it's your Geary. It's your humble honor. It is your uh, duty to uh, thank the sponsors. So go ahead and say thank you to at WebSpy on your Twitter account. Thank you to at Power VPS and at DNA Mail. And of course, Ustream, uh, the quality of Ustream video. You've seen this over here? It's just like getting yeah, better it's getting better. really, really good. I don't know what they're doing over there. I guess they have all that money, but they, they are really, isn't it amazing how web streaming has just gotten good? It's gotten good. Yeah. It was like five years ago, it was like not even possible. Right. No, it's, it's not possible to do live streaming. And now it's just like, oh yeah, fire up the Ustream, you, right. you've got your own cable channel. It is fascinating. Crazy stuff. Yeah, the iPhone app is great too. You can use that a I lot. I saw too. people running around. I had I had people accosting me. It's a little annoying the iPhone application because basically everybody is running around South by Southwest, uh -huh. drunk, going, "Hey, Cal <laughs> And then you're on your stream. Yeah, and I'm oh, like, God. my. Uh, I mean, I'm like, I'm not coming out of the party. I put my glasses on because I'm so my eye. Uh, I mean, I'm not like drinking heavily, but I don't. You know, it's like, ah, and then you know that's gonna wind up on like some it's on the internet forever. Some gawker pose. I'm just like, oh, please leave me alone. Gosh, Oof. how long are you stay in LA for? Just a winter? Uh, yep, I'm staying here until uh, end of April, when it's safe to come back to Chicago. Huh. Compare contrast, Chicago, Malibu. Uh, the nature out here, the weather out here, everything about just the environment is so much nicer out here. Yeah. But city life of Chicago kicks city lives of LA any day of the week. It's probably true. Uh, you ever done a 10-minute scale canyon hike, Santa Monica Mountains, any of that stuff yet? I uh, know, no. you got to do uh, some hikes. Yeah, i got to do Absolutely. I'll take Thanks. you up Temescal Canyon. That's the best I'm, one. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, for filling in for Great. Lon. Tyler, anything to add? Anything we need to know about? Anything Great upcoming? episode. I think we were overdue for uh, some heated uh, exchanges on this show. We need a little bit more of that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I like it. Uh, so thank you to the sponsors, and uh, thanks to the crew, uh, Emily and Kenny. Great job. And this week in Twitter is 11 a.m. Fridays. 
This week in Android, 4 p.m. Fridays, which is, I think, an hour from now. Uh, this week in cloud computing is Wednesdays at 3 o'clock. And this Sunday, congratulations to my good friend, poker buddy, and partner on the ThisWeekIn.com network, Kevin Pollack, is celebrating his one-year anniversary this Sunday. What time is the show Sunday? Is he on 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock? 3 p.m. Sunday, Pacific time. He's going to have all his previous guests. Well, not all of them, because that would be about 50 or 60. But he's going to have a good number of them uh, here. And it's going to be a raucous show. I will be here as well. Uh, this Sunday, tune in to KevinPollocksChatShow.com, and we'll see you all. Thanks for coming, David. Thanks, we're a great pleasure. Guest. I think this is going to be one of the, what do you think, Tyler, is going to rank in the top five shows? I, I want to see the, after you read the book and get them both on, that, that's going to be the I'm going to have Jason Friedman, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, my God, Jason Friedman and Jason Calacanis are always fighting. And I'm like, yeah. I don't even know the guy. I'm not fighting with him. I think 37 Sizzle is great. It's amazing how this Internet stuff happens. Yes. Very easy for people to hate each other over the interwebs and Twitter. It's very hard for people, in intelligent person, people right. in person, they're actually like, ah, oh, like I want to hang out with this guy. Right. I'm gonna fight this guy over my house for dinner. <laughs> All right, we'll see everybody next time on this week in startups. Spiked out, I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely from. No.